pretty song, sang well with a great message. When Jesus reaches down for us, he's doing it right now. We are in his house at the right time on the right day to worship. Before I share a message, the message was about everyone marveled. Surprise, a fourth sermon came after three. The fourth one, everyone marveled. Gerald Coomer saw a picture on Facebook. One of my clergy friends put on Facebook last week of Karen and I back in 1996 with all three children. And Gerald said, Brother Steve, you should put that on the screen. No, you really should put that on the screen. <laughs> so I said, okay, Gerald, fair is fair. So here is a, a picture of, that you will marvel at of Karen and me and the girls in 1996, 18 years ago. There we are. That's it. That's quite a picture. Karen, look at those glasses, buddy. <laughs> All right, that's enough. Take it off screen. <laughs> that's good, Clint. Come on, Clint. <laughs> Get out. All right. As we talk about marveling, uh, let's look into the scriptures about when the men marveled at Jesus, when he calmed the storm. If you'd stand, I want to read the account in two different Gospels, from Matthew in chapter 8 and Mark in chapter 4. Actually, let me shift here. All right, let's see if that's working today. And buddy, you may have to give it a little more high EQ. I had to turn it down at a wedding, so it may need some highs in there. Okay, Matthew chapter 8, the account of the calming of the storm. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly, a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Now Mark's account, chapter 4, 35 to 41. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with them. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Our last three messages have been for the body as we prepare to reach out to our community. Of course, we reach out every week and every Sunday, but we're particularly offering a five-Sunday sermon series to the community. We have sent out the uh, postcards Make this fall a season of hope. 5,000 of these. That's most of the Adair County addresses. The shirts. Make this season a season of hope. This fall a season of hope. We want to get the word out. Because as those, in those three messages, and then today, Clint, I've got these in, in, in the computer there. Everyone matters. Everyone 
matters. Everyone ministers, everyone magnifies, and everyone marvels. Everyone marvels at the work of Jesus today. He still works in our hearts today. And to be honest with you, when people see a person who is secure in God, they marvel. There's not a lot of security going around these days. There's a lot of insecurity and a lot of instability. From ISIS to Ebola to financial issues to, to you name it. We are secure. We know the world is unstable. It's been unstable in Jesus' day. It became unstable the day Adam and Eve ate the fruit. But there is a hope, a security in Jesus. I'll come to that in a moment. The reason I picked out the Mark passage, the Matthew passage is the main one, because the New King James says, the men marveled, who can this be? The winds and the sea obey him. Women marvel also, but for God's reasons, he has picked out men to lead, to lead their homes, to lead in the church, and women can certainly lead too in both places. But he has called men. We have many men who serve and who lead. When men marvel, they go, that has to be pretty convincing. This convinced all the disciples. Pretty amazing. I picked out the Mark passage because it says, it quotes Jesus. Mark says, Jesus said, let us cross over to the other side. Let's go from here to there. And so I lift out of that text, let us cross over also. Let us, as a Trinity Church, cross over over the next five weeks of sermons, cross over in the, at least these different ways. Clint, there's a slide for this. From anger to peace, that's not easy. From fear to faith, there's a lot of fear, and yet faith, a little faith goes a long way. From troubled to trusting, from shaken to secure, from helpless to hope, to a biblical hope. Not a, a Webster Dictionary hope that says a condition that may happen or a circumstance that might come about. No. Biblical hope is a confident assurance of God's help, a secure trust in God's good plan. Biblical hope stands in our heart even when we don't feel it, when we feel like things aren't happening right. We trust our hope is secure in God. The word for today that kind of came out of the text to me, or it came as a theme word, was the word marvel. So I want to look that up in the Greek. What, what does that specifically mean? I understand marvel when we go... Wow, that's amazing. What does it mean in the Greek? It's the word thaumadzo. Thaumadzo has this definition, these two definitions in Greek, to wonder or wonder at or marvel. You might thaumadzo at a sunset, just wonder at it. It means to be wondered at and to be held in admiration. And it's translated by a number of different words, amazed, astonished, flattering, flattering, marvel, marveled, surprised, and it's used different, different times in the New Testament. This, let's look at this word where it's used. Clint, there's a screen there throughout the New Testament books. It shows us where thalmazo is used. The Gospels use it pretty well, but which book uses it the most? See, Clint, you got me okay? It should be a table. There we are. Which book uses marvel or amaze the most? Luke, 13 times. And I tell you, a few of those times are in Luke 1 and Luke 2 when Zechariah takes the pen and writes, John, the crowd was amazed. When the shepherds came in from the fields and told their account, they were amazed. 
They were, they marveled. So throughout the 43 times this word is used, the people marveled at the works of God. And of course, at many other times they would be, use different words to show their wonder and amazement. But this is the kind of God we serve who does things that are amazing. It's easy when we see something physical happen. It's harder when we realize that something spiritual is happening. It's harder when we sing amazing grace because that's in the heart. But as we still marvel when we see that change on someone's face. All right, let me dig in. Let me give you three things. That when Jesus did these things, the people marveled. I can't sum up the whole New Testament, but I picked out three things where the Bible says that the people marveled. Number one, when he commanded his creation, they marveled. When he commanded the creation. We know in one account, Jesus commanded the fish to fill the net. He hollered out off the shore to Peter. They came up dry, empty on one side. He said, throw your net to the other side. All right, Lord. They throw it over there. And they fill, fill the nets full of fish. Jesus commanded the creation, commanded the fish. He commanded the bread to multiply to 5,000 families and to 4,000 families. He commanded a fish to bring a coin. He commanded the water to turn to wine. Why do we worry about the creation? The Creator commands it, and He still commands it. Let me share also at this point about the creation. We experience the waves like the disciples experienced the waves hitting the boat. We experience waves of blessing and waves of trouble. Now behind the waves that hit the boat is the wind. Jesus rebuked the wind. The wind stopped. And if you've been out on the lake, if the wind stops, what happens to the waves? Whoosh, flat. The Bible says in both gospel accounts, there was a great calm. That means there wasn't a wave one. That water was like glass. Behind the waves that hit us, the good waves and the bad waves, is a wind. Not a wind we can see, not a wind you can measure. But behind a lot of these waves is the wind of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 3, Jesus called or compared the Spirit to wind. The Spirit moving and causing circumstances that are a blessing and they wash over us. Oh, Lord, keep that coming. Keep it coming. Wisdom and compassion and love and joy. Oh, that's sweet. Keep it coming. But there's another source of these waves. Satan. Not every wave, but a number of waves will come at us from our enemy. And they'll wash over us and bring trouble. They'll bring fear. They'll bring sadness. They'll bring despair. They'll bring pride. They'll bring anger and rages of anger. And you just want to shake that off, get that off of me. But behind these circumstances is a wind. And we want to know, who, who is it? Is it God? Lord, please bring it on. If it's Satan, command it to stop. Did you know that you can command Satan to stop? You can. You ever have a bunch of really junky lies come into your head? It may be your own selfishness and your own fallenness, but it may be what's called lying spirits talking to you, lying to you. Doing the very thing that Satan does best, lying. You can command them to stop. Just as Jesus rebuked this wind, you can rebuke the enemy. Stop in the name of the Lord Jesus. And you will feel the change. In, it wasn't 96, but it was 90, in 92, a bunch of thoughts in my head was convincing me we'd be moving at, in our second year. Oh, we're moving. Patty, we'd be moving. 
I wouldn't see a conference. I'd be in a different church. Uh, we're moving at year two. And at that point, God was teaching me to just tell the enemy the way it is. So I commanded these lying thoughts to stop in the name of Jesus. And they stopped. Long enough for me to sense from the Holy Spirit, no, you'll be here seven years. This isn't here. It's somewhere else. But it stopped all that dark rubbish long enough for me to hear from the Holy Spirit the truth. And we were there seven years. And then it was time to move. So this, there's, there's real authority that Jesus gives to us. But he is the first to command the creation. I'll get to the rest later. Um, let me read this to you. In Matthew 21, 19 and 20. Another creation story. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, excuse me, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered, withered away. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? You and I could cut that fig tree with a saw and those leaves would still be green for a few days. Then they'd curl and dry up. That fig tree withered right in front of them. Once again, the man marveled. Wow! Who is this that can command trees to wither? And I close this section with the verse from today's reading. Matthew 8, but he said to them, Why are you fearful, you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Secondly, people marveled when Jesus taught the truth. He speaks like, he doesn't speak like our rabbis and our Pharisees and our teachers of the law. He speaks with authority. Let me read you one small account, a minor account. Mark 12, verses 16 and 17. The debate is, should we pay taxes or not? Jesus tells them, bring the coin over here. So they brought it, and he said to them, whose image is? And inscription is this. They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Wow. That stopped the debate. The truth. In the King James, Jesus will say, Verily, verily, I say unto you, in other versions, he will say, truly, truly, I say unto you. When you see those words repeated, verily, verily, underline what comes next, because he is telling you the truth. The truth has a sobering effect on us. It may not be what we exactly want to hear. Well, Jesus, I don't really want to do that. Well, this is the truth. To the rich young ruler, he didn't tell him exactly what he wanted to hear. But he told him what he needed to do. The rich young ruler didn't do it. To the others that followed, blessing. Anyway, I need to move on to the third point. People marveled when he delivered from the devil. Matthew 9, as they went out, behold, they brought to him a man mute and demon-possessed. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitudes marveled saying, it was never seen like this in Israel. This time the multitudes, the men and the women and the youth and children, marveled. They saw a man bound up by the enemy. The enemy cast out of the men, then the man could speak. So much of the New Testament is Jesus commanding the creation, including our bodies, to heal and be right. So much he taught the truth. So many times he delivered from the enemy. This, this was his ministry. So we marvel. We marvel today telling these stories. But now let me turn things around. 
Jesus marveled also, but only twice. Of those 43 times that the word thelmazo is used, Jesus only used it twice, or about him. What do you think Jesus marveled at? There's a great lesson here. Let me read to you Mark 6, 4 through 6a. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in, in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there, he's in Nazareth, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Let me read you the other time this word is used in regards to Jesus, the New Testament. Matthew 8, 8 through 10. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. And he said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Jesus marveled in regards to faith. Either you don't have it, or you have it. He marveled at their unbelief, which is the same word as lack of faith, no faith. And he marveled when the centurion had faith. What does that tell us? It brings a spotlight down that Jesus is looking for faith. He's looking for us to trust Him. Trust what He says. Because that's when He marvels. That's when He is amazed and He wonders, is in wonder when we have faith to trust Him. Jesus was looking for faith, for belief in Him and in His Word. The centurion had great faith. The people in Nazareth had no faith. The disciples in the boat had little faith. Guess what Jesus also said after the fig tree? You might have thought, Brother Steve, you're being kind of boring and redundant with this creation thing. But there's more to that fig tree story. Listen to the passage that follows what I already read you. Matthew 21, 21. So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also you will say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and it will be done. You and I could shrivel fig trees or maple trees or oak trees if we needed to. Faith. Faith. And you know that. I, I, you know that. You know, last week I turned the pulpit around for the contemporary service, put it towards the choir, and the, the fellows came from London to, to give us a bid on the, the pew coverings. And the first thing he said to me was, hey, that's pretty good. You're preaching to the choir. <laughs> I said, and you're pretty witty. So that was, that was pretty good. But now I'm turned around facing you all, but you know this too. That faith is what, where it happens. San, Sandy, wherever you get that little packet on the mustard seed, I've got to hear my Bible. Someone at the farmer's market gives out these uh, mustard seeds with a scripture from Matthew 17, 10. If you have faith as a mustard seed, say to this tree, be uprooted and throw yourself in the sea. Say to this mountain, throw yourself in the sea. It'll obey you. Are we worried about trees and mountains? Not particularly. Are we, are we worried about sin and guilt and shame? Yes. Are we concerned with our Adair County brothers and sisters that aren't in Christ or they're not close to Christ? Are we concerned about them? Yes. Do we want them to have a season of hope? Yes. Will you bring them a card, bring them a t-shirt, send them an invitation, give them a phone call? Would you ask the people that are not in Christ or are not in church, would you ask them to come? Please. You know them. You know, you know all of them. Karen and I walk around, we don't know anybody but you all. But you know them. 
and they know you and you represent the Lord well ask them to come you know as we go into to get into the boat to cross over we're gonna cross over last year we got in a boat in the fall and by the time we reached the other shore Summer Brown was our family ministry team leader and Ashton Piles was our millennial ministry team leader because God spoke those two positions in the revival. He did other things too I could, I could list for you. So I know this year he's going to do things that he wants to do. What? I don't know. He hasn't told me. Oh, I was part of a revival once and the revival preacher said on the first night of a four-night revival, let's ask God for a hundred souls to be saved in this revival. And I sat in the pew and I said, I wouldn't do that. And you might say to me, well, where is your faith? And I might say, I don't know, I guess I'm a weakling. But I wouldn't say that to start a revival. What if one person or seven people are converted what if we fell 93 people short of our goal? I'm going to rejoice over the seven or over the one. I'm going to let God do what God has planned to do. But I'm going to ask you to continue to pray it with me that he'll do it. That's why we're fasting and praying first part of October and we'll continue it first part of November. And I hope we're praying the whole time that God will truly draw people who need hope. You and I know that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. I dare not trust, Gerald, this muscular frame, because it ain't going to get me to heaven. We know salvation is in Jesus, and we know from salvation comes a security and a hope and a faith and a love that has no other source. Just Jesus. So help me to invite people. Help me to invite the Holy Spirit. Next week may be the hardest message, hope and sadness. Don, I hope you come back next week. It's going to be a sad one, but we'll all cry with you. Next week we'll remember our members who have died and any other folks you want to remember. And we will have a hope in sadness, a secure assurance that the people that we have names for on that table are in heaven. And an assurance in our heart, because we are in Christ, we will be in heaven one day too. It's not, I wonder if. No, it's, I just wonder when because I know I'm going. And you know you're going. I hope you know you're going. Hope. Would you share this with people and invite them to a security in Jesus Christ?